Now our next presenter is uh, Tay Netoff, who rather heroically has just arrived from the airport about 15 minutes ago. And uh, I'll hopefully you've had enough rest on the plane on the way over, but um, we all understand what it's like. So uh, hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Let's see if um, so so I'm um, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> um, I, um, I, I, it actually it's looks not like up. you're projecting okay. another screen. Thank you. Let's see. Okay. So I set this talk up to be sort of an introduction to machine learning for the grad students in, in the audience. And I think I, um, I, I, I feel like I probably missed the mark. <laughs> but, and I'm hoping uh, this is just going to be sort of a general tutorial to um, machine learning. And, and, um, I hope at this point just not to piss people off, but um, as a as a uh, introduction. So, so some of the places I've used machine learning a lot, and we were using machine learning a whole lot in this field, and, and like the cattle uh, competition for seizure prediction. I mean, they're all just machine learning algorithms that people are applying. And so we use it for decoding. Like I've been working on problems where and we're reporting from neurons and spinal cord and asking, can we detect when that neuron is conveying information about itch or pain? Uh, we can use it for state identification, like identifying when patients in a pre-seizure state versus an uh, We use it for diagnosis, like can we see differences in EEG patterns in patients that are on drugs or off drugs, or patients that might be responders or not responders. Um, and then optimization, can we use machine learning to help improve therapeutic outcomes. Um, and so there's lots of problems for machine learning. Um, so identification for separates two populations, optimization, and quantification um, of data sets. And there's two sort of classes of machine learning. Uh, one supervised, where you know what the outcome was, and you're trying to find what was it that distinguishes these two groups. And the other is unsupervised learning, where you have a problem and you kind of know what's good and what's bad, but um, you don't really have a solution. And so the machine learning algorithm is trying to figure out what's a good solution. And I think this is a really powerful tool for uh, optimizing therapy. Um, so I'll go through these a little bit. So we've got to start off with some kind of measure from the patient. And so we can talk about time series, so EEG or fMRI data, or you can get things like gene check data um, and or classes like different patient outcomes. These are all different kinds of data that we can collect from the patient and it can be very different types. Some of them, it might be very important, especially if you're putting in stimulus and measuring both response, that what happens at particular times. Other things might not be time dependent. Um, so like if you're just looking at changes that might happen in Preictal versus interictal, there may not be an event, but there's just patterns and so it's going to be time variant signals that you're looking at. And so when you're, you take those measures, then you have to extract some kind of feature. So you get raw data, and we can go from original time series, you can think of as individual time points, especially if you're looking at a stem evoke response. Uh, we can, if it's time invariant, we often will look at the power spectrum of the data and look at power as a function of frequency. Uh, and sometimes we will take some kind of amalgam of all the different data that we have and try to make uh, some kind of reduction into something that might be meaningful like principal components. So we usually extract some kind of features from the, the raw data and what, what you measure and, what you, and how you extract it and distill it down is really, really important in the uh, success of a machine learning algorithm. Uh, so one of the reasons why we use machine learning is because a lot of the data we see is really, really complicated, right? And so it's very hard for clinicians to go look and say, oh, this is what changes between this patient and here. And we do this a lot. We look at data and we try to identify what we think is what uh, identifies the two groups. But uh, using machine learning algorithms really helps quantify those things and makes it much more rigorous. Um, you guys are all familiar with like the mismeasure of man, that you know, where the, the guy takes uh, you know the skull and like shoving it with foam, you know, and trying to find the volume of the skull. And it becomes very easy to like, you know, change which outcomes are by how much foam you push into the cranium to sort of fit your bias. And so it's really important to sort of 
uh, take away the biases and, and use things like machine learning to quantify results. So what we often will use statistics to sort of prove that something is, you know, is important. And generally, if we, we think of these, whatever our measures maybe came from a Gaussian distribution, uh, we, we do something like a P, you know, a T test between them. And so, you know, the further the means are apart, you know, this is a little sample of each, the, you know, the probability of it gets larger and larger. So we often will use this P test to, or the T test to sort of measure how important a, a difference is. But you can see there's a lot of overlap between these two distributions. And so if we kept two that have distributions that have the same, just a slight difference in their means, so there's a lot of overlap, but just kept adding more points, you can see our P values here, here I'm adding sample size, the P values at some point start showing a significant difference between the means, even though the differences aren't changing, uh, there's just the number of samples. And so the P value is really sensitive to the number of points. It's not really a good estimate of how separable they are. So when you're doing a t-test, we're sort of asking, are these two data sets different? Did they come from different distributions? But they're not asking, answering the question, which I think is really important for seizure prediction and, and these kinds of problems, which is, is it really a clinically useful test? Right? Are they separable? If I just gave you a data set, could you tell me which class it belonged into? And you can see these two, if I just told you, you know, what the value was, and it, it, you know, for, if it was a value in this range here, you couldn't tell me whether it was a blue or a red very well at all. So it's not a very good metric of how separable groups are and how classifiable they are. So receiver operator curves are much better for that. So here we're taking two distributions of data and this is calculated by taking a threshold. And as we move that threshold, we count how many reds are above the threshold as our number of true positives and how many blues is false positive rates. And as the threshold moves down, we can sort of measure this area under the curve. So if it's if it was just equally distributed, you'd expect this line, the false positive and true positives, to go up along this diagonal. And if they are separable, it goes up above it. And so we measure the area under the curve as a good metric of two, if two signals are separable. And then this is somewhat dependent on the sample size. So the more samples we have, the better the area under the curve is. Um, you can see this area under the curve gets as number of samples gets bigger, but the thing is, is it doesn't keep going up, whereas the p-value keeps going up with more and more samples, right? The problem with the receiver operating curves is that it, this is a really great test, it's non-parametric, um, but the problem with it is that it doesn't, um, it doesn't, uh, it's not very good for multi-variate data sets. If you have two or more measures, it's not very good at separating them. And I'm missing a figure here. I know I'm missing a figure. So, so if you have multiple data sets, uh, we will often do things like if multiple measures from every patient, uh, we will often take something like the principal components on it. So here's one group in blue and another group in red, and we have one measure and another measure, and the principal components are the directions, the first principal components, the direction in the data has the largest variance, and then the second one's orthogonal to that. And if you have multiple data sets, you get multiple orthogonal. Um, and one of my favorite examples of principal components of this data set is the city's data set in MATLAB. So there's a whole bunch of metrics of different cities in the United States that measure economics, recreation, arts. So a lot of these things are related to each other. There's like seven, I think there's nine different measures they use of it. And then if you can take the principal components of it and project it on the first two principal components, you can see there's some nice separation. So you get New York City sits out here, and you get some small cities up here that are quite nice, and some big cities down here. And Minnesota, where I'm living, is sort of in this nice area here, where it's not too big of a city, and it's, it's an outlier in the size. So it's a really nice way to sort of visualize multivariate data into some nice two dimensions. And then, of course, as you add in more and more dimensions, the percentage of the data that you can explain goes up. So with just one principal component, you can specify about 75% of the variance coming from the cities. And with two of them, you get about 80% and three, about 80, 
it's, it's hard to read the numbers there. But so you know you can use the amount explained of the, um, which is the, sort of the sum of the eigenvalues to tell you how much is explained. I know this is all very basic. I'm sorry. It's, I, I just thought it was intended to be a tutorial. Uh, so principal components, of course, is blind. It doesn't really know much about the, the data sets. And it's, and it's optimized to maximize the variance. Independent component analysis recognize that when you have mixtures of many different signals, that it starts to look more and more Gaussian. So if you want to separate a signal out on its own, so it's called blind source separation, that you, you uh, maximize the kurtosis. Right, so it measures the kurtosis and then essentially starts with the principal components and starts jittering them around and maximizes the kurtosis. So it's just sort of another rotation um, and it's done blindly, just maximizing that statistic. Um, we, we need metrics when we do different, uh, to maximize things, we need sort of measures of distances between whatever your values are from the different groups and different measures that you have. So we can take things like Euclidean distance and city block, but a lot of these metrics usually compare just, you know, two measures taken at the same time or two frequencies if you're looking across the power spectrum. And it tends to be really, really bad when you start having peaks and one peak moves with respect to the other. So let me show you, this is an example of a neuron spiking. Is actually two recordings there, one on top of each other. And I'm just changing the parameter of one. And you can see that as I'm changing the action potential stop overlapping, if I measure the cross correlations between these two as a function of the amount of current I'm driving in to the cells, you can see the, the cross correlation starts to drop very, very rapidly as soon as these action potentials no, no longer overlap. But there's another metric called an earth mover distance. And this is, somebody pointed this out to me recently. I fall in love with this tool. Haven't really used it yet. But the idea is, is if you looked at this sort of as a mountain range, you sort of ask how much dirt do you have to move from the blue lines to make it match up to the red lines. So you can sort of have a distance on how far you can move the dirt. The further you have to move the dirt, the better, the more it costs to do it. And so there's some really nice optimization algorithms that go and measure how much earth you have to move. And so that's a distance metric. And you can see down on the bottom there, I'm changing as we change this, the distance goes up fairly smoothly. Uh, and so this tends to be a much, much better metric for distance and problems that we see a lot of, especially when you're looking at things like power spectrum where the peak may change in frequency a little bit, which would make the distance really bad if you're using something like a cross correlation. So once we have, uh, if we have two groups and we already know what one class was and what the other class is, the, the simplest method is to use linear discriminant analysis to separate the two out. So the linear discriminant analysis, you provide it to two groups, and what it tries to do, it finds a plane uh, that essentially maximizes the, the distance and the means between the two data sets. Right? So it's a, it's a nice linear um, solution to this problem. Um, the problem with it is it always de determines a, a straight line between the two. Uh, but you can do things like quadratic linear discriminant analysis, and you can make curved lines, and you, then you start getting a parameter which starts to, you start to play with, which is like how curvy can these lines be, right? So there's a free parameter in that. Uh, nice thing about linear discriminant analysis is it can be applied to multiple classes. So we can say here's three classes of data, and we want to separate them all optimally. Um, so it can come up with uh, lines that separate them all. Support vector machine tends to be a little bit more uh, flexible than linear discriminant analysis. It's a very, very powerful tool. Sometimes the results don't look all that different. Um, you, you, it, optimization is slightly different. So rather than separating the means of the two groups, it's trying to just m draw a line that makes the separation of all the points from a line the maximum. And then there's uh, guys who are right at the border are called support vectors. So you can see these blue lines are the, these circled guys are the support vectors that help determine this line, which is, gives you the maximum distance from this, this line here. Uh, and here is a different problem where I said, well, one data set is in the center and the other is in the surround. 
And so the support vector machine does a terrible job of separating them if you're just doing the line. But the nice thing about support vector machine, uh, and it can be done with linear discriminant analysis, is you can pop it into a third dimension. So this is called the kernel trick. So if you take a data set like this, and you essentially take the data as a, the distance from the center and make it a third dimension on it, that makes it so you can make a plane that cuts between the two data sets. And then, so then you can start getting interesting uh, borders between the two data sets. And the, the, but we have free parameters again when we start doing that. So if we change those free parameters, you can go from something that's a fairly smooth line here to get slightly more tortuosic. It gets even more tortuosic. And you can get to the point where this line does almost a perfect separation between the green and the red dots. Um, but it ends up really gerrymandering the data set, right? And so you, if you start taking these lines, uh, these boundaries, and apply it to a new data set, it tends to not do a great job of separating it. It's just too complicated. So you've got to find some balance between something that's too complicated and something realistic. So here is how accurate can we separate the two data sets when I use it on the data set that I train it with. And here is on, if I train it on one data set and then apply it to another data set, so this is very torturistic, it, it eventually gets worse and worse. And so there's some sort of sweet spot in how smooth the boundary is that gives you the maximum separation. So we need to go through and like maximize these parameters. And so we usually take our data and break it up into chunks. We, we label one data set for uh, training it. Uh, so if I had something like 15 patients here, I might take five patients to train the support vector machine. And then I'd test it on another five patients and, and test it over and over and over again, changing the parameters until I got a good uh, out of sample separation. But you can still do a pretty good job of making a good, uh, just by cycling through training and testing if it's a small number of patients. Uh, a fairly good separation. So then what you really have to do is um, test it on uh, out of sample set that wasn't used in, in the optimization at all. So this is double cross validation and you could just do it uh, once or you can essentially randomly assign patients to each or subjects to each uh, training test and validate set and repeat it many many times uh, through an n-fold cross validation. Uh, and usually what you do is you report what's the actual um, prediction rate or on the, the final test set. And, and if you have a small number of set of uh, data points, you can use what are called Latin squares, which give you all the possible combinations um, of, of ordering of these, these data sets. So the last thing I want to show is some, some neat things about unsupervised learning. So I know you're probably all pretty familiar with supervised learning, uh, but I want to show you unsupervised learning is where you have like a rat and he's going around a maze and he's trying to find, uh, he has to make a decision whether to go left or right. He gets a reward, which is food at the end of it. And, and so coming from psychology, they've sort of recognized animals have certain behaviors and how they optimize this kind of problem. And what you need is a well-defined state, like where is the animal and it's in the maze, and where did it get food last. It has a well-defined action and it has a well-defined reward. And there's some really nice algorithms for optimizing these kinds of problems. So we need to define the state, so like whether the patient's seizing or not seizing, eight actions, like what's the possible stimulation frequency you want to apply for deep brain stimulation, uh, and then some reward, like you know, if there's less seizures, that's good, um, or you could look at the power spectrum and say there's certain frequency bands we want to minimize. And so here is, Here's an algorithm, and, and this is just sort of a preview to uh, Vivek Nagaraj's poster, who he's going to present this in, in the talk. So uh, the algorithm we use is called the SARSA model, um, and we're trying to choose stimulation frequencies, the animal state, so we look at the seizing activity, and we sort of filter the seizure activity, uh, and we take the derivative of it, so we have a filtered power over time, and the derivative of that, so you can see this red line, is, is the state uh, <coughs> estimation at any particular moment in time. Here's an example. This is the epileptor model, so the Jersa and Stacy model of seizures, and you can see uh, when we sort of filter it, this is the state 
uh, over time. So this is one state, this is the low frequency power and the derivative of that. So this is when it's in the high frequency activity and this is when it's sort of in the interictal phase. We get a state like this. And so at any particular time, we can say where we're in, what state we're in. And what we can do is, for every action that we have, we can make a map and say, what reward did we get? So how many seizures did we see if the animal was at a particular state and we didn't apply nothing? Or if we applied 100 hertz or 110 hertz or 120 hertz? So we start out with all the different actions and we're trying to make a map. And then once you have all of your action maps, you sort of look at across them all and ask which one is going to be the maximum Rewards. So the, the color here is telling you which stimulation frequency gave you the maximum reward at that particular state. So if I'm up here, it's telling me 100 hertz stimulation is the best. If I'm over here, 50 hertz stimulation is the best. And so let me just show you this in a, a really quick uh, example. So here it is seizing it up here. And here's the stimulation frequency. It's going and testing different stimulation frequencies. And then we're measuring reward, which is essentially the inverse of the uh, power going on. And you can see the state moving around. So this sort of tells you where the current state is. And it is, I'm just showing you what the, it thinks of the optimal stimulation frequency. So when it starts out, it has no idea what the optimal stimulation frequency is. Um, and so it just picks one at random, it applies it, it sees what the reward is, and then goes through and tries and it makes this map. And at some point it thinks 60 hertz is the best, but then it starts getting some breakthrough seizures. And so it goes back and, and starts applying slightly higher frequencies and sort of settles in at 80 hertz. And so you can sort of change how quickly this thing goes and explores different frequencies, um, how quickly it learns given the information it has. So if you have really good clean data, you can learn really fast. If it's really noisy data, you want to sort of learn slowly. Uh, and so there's all sorts of parameters to play with. And this is a really simple algorithm that we're actually implementing in a real-time um, software and testing it on some um, in seizing animals. Uh, but it's, where it's worked very nicely in the computational model at the moment. So just to, just to give you a couple sources, um, you know, there is a reinforcement learning. So Sutton and Bartow, these are the guys that sort of wrote this reinforcement learning algorithm. It's an excellent introduction into reinforcement learning. An introduction to pattern recognition in MATLAB is a really good machine learning algorithm uh, book that goes through all the different machine learning algorithms. It, it, you know, machine learning is used heavily in the image uh, analysis, and, and MATLAB has tons and tons of uh, toolboxes for that. So, so that was my attempt at trying to get like an intro tutorial to <laughs> machine learning in 25 minutes. Any questions? Yeah. Go ahead. Nice talk. I really enjoyed the, the nice overview. Um, one section earlier I made about receiver operating curves and you know distinguish things statistically versus severing. I just want to mention that the fellow in Michigan who's done some nice work with multivariate estimates trying to estimate. Be able to distinguish things using estimates on the error, the um, phase of the error, which kind of fits in with your time. So, if something, if, if for those of the audience interested in that, for multivariate cases, there is. There are some extensions, several receivers in multivariate? Yes, so there are some interesting extensions. So, it makes sense. I understand the kind of cost. Yeah, otherwise, I don't know. The most first part of the estimate would be able to have some Yeah. Thank you. Have you tried? Could you have you done that as a normal uh, rack navigating your maze? Maybe. Well, so the, so the rack is acting as an actor in what it's doing that. So, so they model how the animal behaves in a maze using the reinforcement learning algorithm and asking what are the parameters that best fit the, the rat's behavior. But here we're actually letting the computer actually act as an actor. And the problem that we started with was I, I was looking at, see, we're trying to do seizure suppression and trying to pick some parameter, and I thought, 
you know, if I could watch fast enough and two things, I might be able to get something to work. And then I thought, well, I can write an algorithm to sort of say what I want and what are the possibility, possible actions. And then we found these nice algorithms that once you got the reward and the possible actions, you sort of max it out for you. So I really like the illustration you have of the T test not showing a true difference between those sort of the quote significant difference. Right. That's something that people in this room need to get out to the other people that aren't in the room. So P values have a Unlikely to find things that aren't different. So as we start, especially as things like your EPG start collecting enough information, there will always be And it's, it's important for us to get, we have to find